hello friends, thank you for joining our study. Uh, I just want to say thank you to the Baha'i administration. Uh, please know that this is actually a personal interpretation. It is my opinion and my understanding of the Baha'i writings. Uh, for an official view, please actually refer to the Baha'i writings themselves and jump over to Baha'i.org. Uh, in the description below, you're going to find an MP3 version of this talk, uh, a PDF with all the quotes that are actually being used, and as well, timestamps of the different sections of the talk, so you can always jump ahead or get back to where you were before. And if for any reason you would like to be alerted of upcoming videos, uh, please click subscribe. So today, friends, we're going to be looking at the Great Beyond, a sketch, as I've titled it. And this is an examination of what the Baha'i writings say about the worlds beyond this world. Um, of course, it's only my personal opinion, and this is really just going to be a conversation starter in the hopes of offering to the friends um, a bundle of quotes and a bundle of ideas about how those quotes relate to each other uh, to be used and evolved and, if you will, debated and dialogued on. Uh, I love this first quote which we're going to read because of the expression it uses of the great beyond. It is a passage relating to the passing of the greatest holy leaf, the sister of Abdu'l-Baha. A sorrow, reminiscent in its poignancy, of the devastating grief caused by Abdu'l-Baha's sudden removal from our midst, has stirred the Baha'i world to its foundations. The greatest holy leaf, the well-beloved and treasured remnant of Baha'u'llah, entrusted to our frail and unworthy hands by our departed master, has passed to the great beyond, leaving a legacy that time can never dim. The Great Beyond is such a wonderful phrase uh, to relate to what happens after this life, in my mind, for multiple reasons. First, um, really when we look at the Baha'i Writings, the amount of information we have about what the worlds beyond this world are like is just so massive. There's so many quotes. Uh, as you will see, this compilation I'm working from is quite large itself. Um, in addition to that, we actually see how expansive that world is. So there's so many quotes, but at the same time we see how the enormity, if you will, of the great beyond. And third is the duty and obligations, I feel and believe, for the Baha'is to actually first get a very, very clear picture of what the writings of the Bab, Baha'u'llah, Abdu'l-Baha, and Shoghi Effendi say on this matter, and then use them as, if you will, as the materials to build bridges between differing beliefs, if you will, between Christianity, for example, and Buddhism, and to see how, while on the surface these might actually appear a divergent, we can, through a deep understanding of the Baha'i writings, see a ways that we can build a bridge between them, or if you will, a grander map that will enable us to chart a course from the Kingdom of Christianity to the Kingdom of Buddhism, or from something, again, as seemingly divergent as Hinduism and Islam. This first section we're going to look at an analogy that's often uh, used within uh, the Baha'i writings and in Baha'i discourse, which is the analogy of this world and the next world to the world of the womb, in the belly of the mother, and the world we are currently living in. The world beyond is as different from this world as this world is different from that of the child while still in the womb of its mother. The mysteries of man's physical death and of his return have not been divulged and still remain unread. By the righteousness of God, were they to be revealed, they would evoke such fear and sorrow that some would perish, while others would be so filled with gladness as to wish for death and beseech with unceasing longing the one true God, exalted be his glory to hasten their end. Death prefereth unto every confident believer the cup that is life indeed. It bestoweth joy, and it is the bearer of gladness. It conferreth the gift of everlasting life. As to those that have tasted of the fruit of man's earthly existence, which is the recognition of the one true God, exalted be his glory, their life hereafter is such as we are unable to describe. The knowledge thereof is with God alone.
the Lord of all the worlds. So we see that the world beyond is as different from this world as this world is different from that of the child while still in the womb of his mother. And this relates to, as Baha'u'llah said in this, this quote from Gleanings, how actually our there is a veil. There is much that we cannot directly access, directly experience, and directly know about the worlds beyond. And then he says that were it to be revealed, it would evoke fear and sorrow in some, right? while others would be so filled with gladness they would wish for death. And it's, it, it, if you will imagine a child being able to see the world that we are currently in, and the reaction of that fetus, if you will, to the enormity or to the responsibility and duty of the world in which we now live, as seen from the womb, and also the degree to which that being had been developed in the womb would relate to these reactions of either fear or exceeding gladness. Um, we're now going to look at a longer passage where Abdu Baha actually expounds upon this analogy of the womb. In the beginning of his human life, man was embryonic in the world of the matrix. There he received capacity and endowment for the reality of human existence. The forces and powers necessary for this world were bestowed upon him in that limited condition. In this world, he needed eyes. He received them potentially in the other. He needed ears. He obtained them there in readiness and preparation for his new existence. The powers requisite in this world were conferred upon him in the world of the matrix. Therefore, in this world, he must prepare himself for the life beyond. That which he needs in the world of the kingdom must be obtained here. Just as he prepared himself in the world of the matrix by acquiring forces necessary in this sphere of existence, so likewise the indispensable forces of the divine existence must be potentially attained in this world. What is he in need of in the kingdom which transcends the life and limitation of this mortal sphere? That world beyond is a world of sanctity and radiance. Therefore, it is necessary that in this world he should acquire these divine attributes. In that world there is need of spirituality, faith, assurance, the knowledge and love of God. These he must attain in this world, so that after his ascension from the earthly to the heavenly kingdom, he shall find all that is needful in that eternal life ready for him. That divine world is manifestly a world of lights. Therefore, man has need of illumination here. That is a world of love. The love of God is essential. It is a world of perfections. Virtues or perfections must be acquired. That world is vivified by the breasts of the Holy Spirit. In this world we must seek them. That is the kingdom of everlasting life. It must be attained during this vanishing existence. By what means can man acquire these things? How shall he obtain these merciful gifts and powers? First, through the knowledge of God. Second, through the love of God. Third, through faith. Fourth, through philanthropic deeds. Fifth, through self-sacrifice. Sixth, through severance from this world. Seventh, through sanctity and holiness. Unless he acquires these forces and attains to these requirements, he will surely be deprived of the life that is eternal. But if he possesses the knowledge of God, becomes ignited through the fire of the love of God, witnesses the great and mighty signs of the kingdom, becomes the cause of love among mankind, and lives in the utmost state of sanctity and holiness, he shall surely attain to second birth, be baptized by the Holy Spirit, and enjoy everlasting existence. We are told here in this passage that just as in the womb of our mother, the limbs and sense organs necessary for the navigation of this world had to be developed, and they would either help or hinder 
the degree to which we can interact with this plane of existence. And that just that we needed to develop there, in the womb for this world, we have to develop certain facets, capacities, and qualities for the coming world now. We ourselves, if you will, are actually building a fetus, a child-like body for ourselves to inhabit in the next world. And it's interesting that very often, when at least I've experienced, say in firesides or dialogues where Baha'is are, uh, if you will, sharing this beautiful analogy, and a very rich analogy with many <laughs> facets that we can tease out, um, they'll say, and these, the way we develop these bodies, the way we develop the limbs is through love, through kindness, through patience. Um, and these are all true. The, the list will be a list of virtues. But I think it's important to notice that that list is actually quite a bit more comprehensive um, within the writings and talks of Abdu'l-Bahá. We see, for example, the need of spirituality, faith, assurance, the knowledge and the love of God. It's these things that we must actually develop. And it says, knowledge of God, love of God, faith, philanthropic deeds, self-sacrifice, severance from this world, sanctity and holiness. And in each of these cases he's numbering them. He's trying to give us a much more comprehensive list, but it means that um, whatever analogy we have, we have to make sure that we expand upon how we represent what Abdu'l-Bahá is saying here. We need to have the knowledge of God in the next world. And part of that will relate to our ability to maintain certitude in God, faith, in the next world. To still have to place trust just as we do here. And it's interesting because often it's, it can be represented in pictures of the great beyond, if you will, that we won't need faith, that we won't need assurance, that we won't need severance from this world. These are themes that are going to keep coming up as we move forward, because I believe the more and more we interact with the Pi writings, we see that this list and structure, these, these qualities that we need, are not limited purely to being a good person. There's a great deal more, and we'll see them come up quite shortly. Here is a quote from Abdu'l-Bahá. The answer to the third question is this, that in the other world the human reality doth not assume a physical form. Rather doth it take on a heavenly form, made up of elements of that heavenly realm. Uh, it is often stated, actually, again within discussions and dialogues, that we do not have a physical form in the next world. And uh, Abdu'l-Bahá in this passage clearly states this, uh, the human reality doth not assume a physical form, rather it takes on a heavenly form. But it still has a form. And then he adds that it actually has elements of that heavenly realm. And in some sense, however we understand this, that world beyond has elements to it. And the form that is actually being built for us to inhabit, that development that we're actually having, is made up of the elements of that world. And this becomes clearer as we move on. The question was then asked as to how it would be possible with no material bodies or environment to recognize different entities and characters when all would be in the same conditions and on the same plane of existence. Abdu'l-Bahá said if several people look into a mirror at the same moment, they behold all the different personalities, their characteristics and movements. The glass of the mirror into which they look is one. In your mind you have a variety of thoughts, but all these thoughts are separate and distinct. Also you may perhaps have hundreds of friends, but when you call them before your memory, you do not confuse them one with another. Each one is separate and distinct, having their own individualities and characteristics. In this passage, some of the examples that Abdu'l-Bahá uses are quite fascinating. Because the question is being asked how it is that if we have no material bodies, that we can actually recognize different entities and characters. And then he gives the example first here of actually in a mirror. When you're looking at a mirror, say you're in a grand party, <laughs> right, a huge social gathering, and you're looking at a mirror along the wall, you see actually all these different figures. But what, in some sense, is the elemental substance of what you're seeing in the mirror? Really, in much sense, the same thing you would if you were to turn around 
which is they're made up of photons. You're actually only, the, the mirror itself is one, the reflective surface is one, what is being transmitted to you is actually one, photons, light, and yet you can still discern that there are different characters. So even though the elements in that world might not be like this world, there is still a fully a ability to discern different pairs, personalities, and characters. He then says if you have a variety of thoughts, for example, I myself can be thinking about what I have to do tomorrow. I could also be thinking about a Superman comic that I was reading, right? And I can be jumbling these two and not think that tomorrow I have something to do, which is to be Superman. I myself can actually look at what often are referred to as abstract objects or abstract entities. We can actually have, say, a story of Sherlock Holmes and then a story of Aesop's fables of the turtle and the hare, and we don't suddenly confuse these two fictional stories into one. We can understand that the story of Batman is not the same, say, as Plato's allegory of the cave, <laughs> two which I would suggest abstract objects, one generally being for fun, and the other one actually being a philosophical treatise through metaphoric language. But we do not actually mash them together. We are able to discern between them. And then I think this is a hint as to what some of the elemental substances of that world beyond actually are, because we are using images and intellectual abstract concepts. And when we, the third example he gives is actually memory, that we can recall these friends, these hundreds of friends, and in the world of our own mind, of our own consciousness, they do not crush together. It is manifest that beyond this material body, man is endowed with another reality, which is the world of exemplars constituting the heavenly body of man. This other and inner reality is called the heavenly body, this ethereal form which corresponds to this body. This is the conscious reality which discovers the inner meaning of things. For the outer body of man does not discover anything. The inner ethereal reality grasps the mysteries of existence, discovers scientific truths, and indicates their technical application. It discovers electricity, produces the telegraph, the telephone, and opens the door to the world of arts. If the outer material body did this, the animal would likewise be able to make scientific and wonderful discoveries, for the animal shares with man all physical powers and limitations. What, then, is that power which penetrates the realities of existence, and which is not to be found in the animal? It is the inner reality which comprehends things, throws light upon the mysteries of life and being, discovers the heavenly kingdom, unseals the mysteries of God, and differentiates man from the brute. Of this there can be no doubt. So there is a world of exemplars that constitutes the heavenly body of man. That's just directly what the quote says. And this heavenly body, the ethereal form which corresponds to this body. We're often told that um, this physical frame which we have is actually itself as if a mirror reflecting the soul of humanity, my individual soul. And it says that this, this reality is what grasps the mysteries of existence, discovers scientific truths, and indicates their technical applications. And I find this fascinating uh, because it, re and it relates very heavily to the Baha'i writings and their relationship to the relation their exposition of the relationship between religion and science, because in the Baha'i faith science is seen as sacred, a holy obligation actually. And in this context we're being told that it is part of our ethereal body, part of the attributes of our ethereal body. And he says later that this inner, inner reality which comprehends things, throws light upon the mysteries of life and being, <laughs> discovers the heavenly kingdom, unseals the mysteries of God, and it is that which differentiates man from the brute. That we actually have reflected here that there, we have a, exemplars within us that constitute right, our heavenly body in the next world. 
And I think it's really important to attend to the examples that he gives immediately after to get a sense of what these exemplars might be like. One is actually just knowledge. The other is the knowledge of the world, of being itself, of life. Then it moves on to discovering the heavenly kingdoms. That there is a the elemental heavenly body that we have is in some ways related to these activities. That it's about discovering the world of the kingdom, realizing that there is a world of the heavenly kingdom, and then unsealing the mysteries of God. And I would suggest this is actually looking at understanding our world, understanding ourselves, discovering that there is a world beyond this realm of abstractions, this realm of divine realities, then actually seeking, recognizing, and actually then unsealing the mysteries of God, and that this is what makes us truly human. The following is a quote from Memorials of the Faithful. I loved him very much, for he was delightful to converse with, and as a companion second to none. One night, not long ago, I saw him in the world of dreams. Although his frame had always been massive, in the dream world he appeared larger and more corpulent than ever. It seemed as if he had returned from a journey. I said to him, Jinab, you have grown good and stout. Yes, he answered. Praise be to God. I have been in places where the air was fresh and sweet and the water crystal pure. The landscapes were beautiful to look upon, the foods delectable. It all agreed with me, of course, so I am stronger than ever now, and I have recovered the zest of my early youth. The breaths of the all-merciful blew over me, and all my time was spent in telling of God. I have been setting forth his proofs and teaching his faith. The meaning of teaching the faith in the next world is spreading the sweet saviors of holiness. That action is the same as teaching. We spoke together a little more, and then some people arrived, and he disappeared. What is happening in this passage? Uh, Abdul Baha tells us, and it's interesting, he says that uh, in the world of dreams, he ac actually witnessed this truly faithful servant, Mullah Ali Akbar. He's, and the portrayal he gives of this figure is very much like here. He speaks, for example, of landscapes, of air and water, if you will, of elemental substance and structure around Mullah Ali Akbar. That is the report in the Memorials of the Faithful. And then he actually speaks of this in the relationship of the world of dreams, where we definitely can <laughs> encounter and experience both our consciousness, other entities, which we can differentiate them from each other, and then uh, travel through landscapes in a form. And he says that in this, and this is something that's going to come up quite a bit later, that he says that he's teaching. That this is actually what Mullah Ali Akbar is doing. He actually says that he is setting forth his proofs and teaching the faith. And I want us all to keep this very much in mind. Mullah Ali Akbar, an entity who has moved into the great beyond, is putting forward proofs of Baha'u'llah's mission. This question of our heavenly body we will return to, or now we're going to move on to some simple general questions that often come up. So in this section, are we, are we reunited with our loved ones? Uh, in this first passage that we've read um, from his messages to the Indian subcontinent. Dear spiritual brother, Shoghi Effendi wishes me to acknowledge the receipt of both your letters dated August 6, 1926. He was most grieved to learn of the great sorrow that has befallen Mrs. Vakil and yourself. A child is undoubtedly the most precious material object a person can possess, and to see it pass away is an irreparable loss to be deeply lamented. We should, however, 
remember the promises we are given of the world to come, and picturing to ourselves the greater spiritual development the departed ones obtain. Comfort ourselves and patiently await our reunion there. Shoghi Effendi wishes me to express to both Mrs. Vakil and yourself his heartfelt condolences and assure you of the share he bears of this sad loss. We are told that we have a reunion with our loved ones, and that our loved ones, when they pass from this life, actually continue to have spiritual development in those worlds beyond. Mrs. S. asked some questions with reference to the conditions of existence in the next world and the life after death. She said that having recently lost a very near relative, she had given much thought to this subject. Many thought that reunion with those we had loved and who had passed on to the future life would only take place after a long period of time had elapsed. She wished to know whether one would be reunited with those who had gone before immediately after death. Abdul Baha answered that this would depend upon the respective stations of the two. If both had the same degree of development, they would be reunited immediately after death. The questioner then said, How could this state of development be acquired? Abdul Baha replied, by unceasing effort, striving to do right, and to attain spiritual qualities. The second passage is more interesting, because it says that the reunion that we have actually with people who have passed on into the next world, quote, depend upon the respective stations of the two. If both have the same degree of development, they be would be reunited immediately, after death. And it's interesting that it's stated that this is related to our ability to have unceasing effort, right, to do right and attain spiritual qualities. So on the one hand, we get reunited with our loved ones, and on the other, we also have this issue that it, that reunion relates somehow <laughs> to the development of the respective stations of the two individuals. And again, this is just something that I want us to actually keep in mind as we move forward. There is a reunion, but that reunion has some relationship to our development and the degree of development of that loved one. Replying to another questioner, he said that when two people, husband and wife for instance, have been completely united in this life, their souls being as one soul, then after one of them has passed away, there, this union of heart and soul would remain unbroken. This final quote in this section, and again we're just trying to begin to uh, keep a mental catalog of many of the nodes or notions or ideas that are coming up. Um, here it actually says that the when two people, husband and wife, have been completely united in this life, and I want to highlight this, then that unit of heart and soul would remain unbroken. That this is a different way of looking at respective stations. That in some sense, the, re the reunion of ourselves with another soul, in a sense, is based upon the union we actually had in this life, and our respective stations. And keep this in mind as we move forward. Those who have passed on through death have a sphere of their own. It is not removed from ours. Their work, the work of the kingdom, is ours. But it is sanctified from what we call time and place. Time with us is measured by the sun. When there is no more sunrise and no more sunset, that kind of time does not exist for man. Those who have ascended have different attributes from those who are still on earth. Yet there is no real separation. Another question that often arises in connection with discussions about the, the great beyond, the next world, is the question of time and place. And we see actually um, in, the, in the reference about Mullah Ali Akbar that there is a movement, a moving around. The analogies that are actually being used of a mirror, that in a sense we can see in the world of dreams, that there can be 
if you will, movement without movement. Because, and I believe these only to be analogies, but we're being shown that, yes, this world has elements, just like that world, right? They actually both have elements, they are of a different nature. And I think here we're being told that, once again, it is not like our time. There is an analogue, if you will, to our time. Because he says, time of us is measured by the sun, but if there's no more sunset or sunrise, that kind of time does not exist for man. And that those who have ascended have different attributes, right, than those that are on earth. So is there a passage of time? I would suggest, of course there is. Is it reckoned how we reckon it? By the passage of the sun, by hours? No. Um, and again, as an analogy, you can see that time even within the world of dreams, if you remember many of them, can be radically different. Time can move swiftly and then slow down, but there is still a procession of what happened first, what happened second, and what happened third. Just as we don't confuse the images in our mind, for example, of the different characters in fictional novels, just as we don't confuse them in the image of the mirror, we do not confuse the chronology of events even if it is marked by a different meter. I can actually think of Napoleon and think of my mother, for example, and have these two figures in my mind and still know chronologically one came long before the other. In the notion of us being above, for lack of a better phrase, uh, this world, in the beyond, uh, our relationship with that feature of reality will actually be different. Just like our relationship to the world of the plant kingdom is different if we're a human, an animal, or a plant. The way we can manipulate it, the way we can interact with it is radically, radically different at each of those stages. The mineral can only feed it, the animal can eat it, while well, we can modify them. The light which these souls radiate is responsible for the progress of the world and the advancement of its peoples. They are like unto leaven which leaveneth the world of being, and constitute the animating force through which the arts and wonders of the world are made manifest. Through them the clouds rain their bounty upon men, and the earth bringeth forth its fruits. All things must needs have a cause a motive power, an animating principle. These souls and symbols of detachment have provided, and will continue to provide, the supreme moving impulse in the world of being. I love this quote because it relates again to the sciences, but also the arts. And we're told that the light radiated from those souls who have ascended fosters the development of the arts and sciences. But also that, and I love the way it's put, they have provided and will continue to provide the supreme moving impulse in the world of being. Holy souls have provided this life and will provide the supreme moving impulse. That again we see this analogy that in the story we saw of Mullah Ali Akbar, that that which we do in this world has its resemblances with that, elements and elements, landscapes and landscapes, ways of drinking even, that there is time and time, and that although they're not identical, they are, if you will, um, images of each other, reflections of each other, and that in the next world we will continue to actually interact with arts and sciences.